we are delighted to have with us Dr. Cynthia Bell. Dr. Cynthia Bell is a Case Western Reserve University Distinguished University Professor. I was there when that happened. That was a wonderful day. And Sarah Idell Pyle, Professor of Anthropology. She is a physical anthropologist whose research focuses on human adaptation to high altitude hypoxia. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. I ought to know something. Um, particularly, the different patterns of adapta adaptation exhibited by Andean, Tibetan, and East African Highlanders. Dr. Bell is internationally known for her work on the biology of people who live in high altitudes. Dr. Bell is a member of the United States National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In addition, on campus, she serves as the chair of the university's faculty senate. Yesterday was her first meeting officially in that position, and she did a wonderful job chairing. Dr. Bell is a past recipient of the CWRU Havorka Prize, which annually recognizes a faculty member whose exceptional achievements in teaching, research, and scholarly service have benefited local, national, and global communities. She received a BA in biology from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's and PhD in anthropology from Pennsylvania State University. Excuse me. We are honored that Dr. Bell is participating in our Power of Diversity Lecture Series, and we look forward to her presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cynthia Bell. Thank you, thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you all for coming. My topic this afternoon is human biological variation where it comes from and why. So this slide here illustrates one example of human biological variation. These are five specimens found about, uh, in the, what is now the country of Georgia in East Europe. They, these people lived one, about 1.8 million years ago. And so what do you think when you take a look at that? What, what, do you, what variation do you see? The, yes. OK. Differences in how pragmatic the draw is. What else? Yeah? Yeah, this one's quite big, this one's very small. You could look at differences in size, you can look at differences in the shape of the top of the cranium. Now these are differences, this is biological variation, right? This is biological variation that you probably never gave a moment's thought to. Virtually every trait that we, you might want to think about We'll, are going, we can find human biological variation. So my question, and it's old, it's contemporary. So where does biological variation come from and why? And biological variation is everywhere. There's visible variation, such as you can see in the different colors of eyes here invisible variation. Uh, we probably all have variation in the shape of our crania. Uh, blood groups are examples of variation. Um, ideally, we can measure the variation so that we can quantify it and analyze it. But measuring and analyzing is not really the reason that we're doing this. We want to understand why a particular trait varies. And we vary for two simple reasons. We have different life histories. Each individual has grown up under a particular set of environmental circumstances that influenced his or her uh, growth and development. And we have different genetic heritage. To give you an example of individual life history differences, a common measure of an individual's life history is adult height. 
And the logic is, is that um, other things being equal, uh, people who are relatively short may have had a, a tougher life in terms of nutrition, infection, and so forth. And this plots the year of birth from 1710 to 1970 of American men and gives us the height. And you can see that from 1710 to 1830, there was a slight increase in height, not a big one, an inch. Then there was a fall in adult height of, and what, from six, almost two inches as people moved to the cities. Poor water, close quarters, more infection. And then with improvements in sanitation and nutrition, by the 1950s, we had gained from 60, about four and a half inches of height, we being uh, adult men. So these are very short-term and big changes in adult height. And they illustrate the fact that there can, we can show a lot of variation <coughs> from time to time, from person to person, in simply in our life histories. Genetic inheritance is another source of variation. You may have heard of the Inuit paradox. The Inuit paradox refers to the fact that Greenlander Inuit eat a diet high in fat, high in protein, yet don't get heart disease. So for a country like ours, where there are all kinds of people taking statins to protect themselves against uh, high uh, cholesterol, we are curious about the Inuit and what are they doing. Well, it turns out that they have genetic adaptations in the metabolic pathway for fats that keeps their cholesterol low even though they have a high fat diet. And here's an example of uh, you know, the getting supper. So here's one example of a genetic variation. In this case, it's a variant that uh, improves people's health. We also have ancient genetic variation as a source of variation among individuals. And here uh, we have two rock pocket mice. These are stars in the evolutionary biology uh, world because uh, we have the blonde mouse here. You can see it's living on blonde sand and it blends in and the black mouse living on black lava, it also blends in with its background. And the reason for their difference in color is different variants of a gene called MC1R. You don't need to know or keep MC1R in mind. However, that same gene accounted for red-haired woolly mammoths, accounts for red-haired Neanderthals, and red hair homo sapiens. So here's a very ancient gene that influences coat color, skin color, hair color in mammals, birds, and reptiles. And it also contributes to variation in us today. Migration from one place to another is a source of genetic variation. This map here is from 2016, and if you'll recall in 2016, there was a huge influx of migrants from the Middle East through Europe, uh, many, over a million of whom had Germany as their destiny. Destination, rather, <laughs> uh, and maybe as their destiny. <laughs> Uh, and some Germans were very upset. And they said, ah, you know, this is going to just ruin our genetic heritage of, of Germans. Well, and so that leads us then to the question of, well, what is the genetic heritage of Germans? Well, the genetic heritage of Germans 
uh, starts with uh, ancient Homo sapiens who've been there for 100,000 years or more. Then, somewhere between 19 and 14,000 years ago, there was a migration of people from the Middle East into Europe. They mixed with, they bred with, formed a large population with the people already there in Europe. 9,000 years ago, farmers came from Turkey. They also moved, presumably following roughly the same route, and bred with the people living there. 5,000 years ago, herders from Russia came west, bred with the people living there. So the European population, although it may think of itself as we are genetically distinct, they are a mixture of at least four populations, three of whom, whoops, three of whom came in the last 20,000 years. This is another source of human variation, genes coming from one environment to another. And one of the reasons that people living in one part of the world, exposed to one set of environments, differ genetically from people living in another part of the world, exposed to another set of environments, is this process of evolution and adaptation. And I mentioned the rock pocket mouse. And here we have a little blonde mouse on black larva. And that little blonde mouse stands out, and it has a particular MC1R variant. And it stands out like a sore thumb there. And its predators are owls. It, the owls are likely to see this guy and any relatives that are also blonde. But to not see and not eat the black ones. Over time, you're going to increase on, the, on this black lava the proportion of black colored variants of MC1R in the mice. The mice living back here in the grass and on the sand, there will be, a, for the same reason, better survival and increase in the number of blonde mice. And that is a simple explanation of evolution by natural selection. We have a trait that is genetically based, in this case, coat color. We have two different environments, the dark lava and the sand. The animals have a different chance of surviving on the different uh, backgrounds. And over time, we're going to wind up with one population living on the lava that's mostly black coat, and one population living on this blonde sand that's mostly blonde coat. And that's all that natural selection is. It's easier said than, uh, than done, but let's examine two cases of adaptation to the environment in people in order to illustrate sources of human biological variation that arise from evolution and adaptation. And I will start with this beautiful photo by, from Sarah Tishkoff illustrating human variation in skin color. You may not think of it automatically, but skin color can be measured objectively and quantitatively. Anthropologists used to use what is called the von Luschan scale. This was a set of tiles of different colors. And you can see they have numbers 27, 26, and 25, and 6, 7, 8. And so what anthropologists in the 1800s did is they took these tiles with them to the field, and they would hold them up and they'd say, oh, yeah, you somewhere between a 7 and an 8 or whatever. And they, they were attempting to standardize their measurements. Nowadays, we can quantify skin color by measuring the amount of light reflected from an individual's skin, as uh, Nina Jablonski, an anthropologist at Penn State, is doing with uh, this study participant. 
And we have one of these machines in the back. So after the talk, if you want to measure your skin reflectance, you may do so. And here's an example of the kind of information that you can get by measuring uh, skin color. And you'll see that we've got two populations, one indicated in blue. This is uh, the skin color measurement is called a melanin index. Melanin is the main dark pigment in our skin. So here we've got one population with an, a range of variation. The most frequent uh, measure looks like it's about 45 for melanin index. And a second population with a different range of variation, but they overlap. It's not one versus another. It's quantitative and it's overlapping. So, and here the most frequent is about, looks like about 65 for the melanin index. And so it's a quantitative trait that we can measure. We can measure it objectively. We know some of the genes. Here I've got a list of seven of the genes that we know about that influence skin color. So that means that my skin color, your skin color, anyone else's, is the result of combinations of variations in a lot of different genes. Having measured skin color in indigenous populations in many parts of the world and plotted them on, as to where the population lived, we get this beautiful map showing gradations of skin color. If we look here at the, sort of around the equator, we see the darkest skin color. So these indicate, the colors indicate from darkest, uh, from lightest to darkest. And you can see that there's a gradation. We start at around the equator with the darkest. As you move slightly north or slightly south, you get a little bit lighter skin color, a little further north or south, a little darker, and so forth. So this very regular pattern globally. So what might account for that? Well, what might account for that is global variation in ultraviolet radiation. This is a similar map. It's a global map. And it is plotting the uh, ultraviolet radiation index on a particular day in October. And uh, it, the scale goes from gray, which is lowest there at the top of the, the globe, up through these colors of purple, which are the highest, ultraviolet index. And the highest ultraviolet indexes are here in the tropics. Well, that, and then they gradually become lower and lower and lower. The higher you go in the latitude or the lower in latitude. Aha! There's a pattern here. There are two patterns that uh, overlap. So what? Well, so what is that ultraviolet radiation is vital to our normal growth and development, our normal function, reproduction, and survival. And ultraviolet radiation exerts an influence by penetrating our skin to just below the surface where it initiates the synthesis of vitamin D. You've heard of vitamin D called the sunshine vitamin. Well, this is why. The ultraviolet radiation in sunshine initiates the synthesis of vitamin D. And traditionally, we had very little vitamin D in our diets. Nowadays, when I ask students, where do we get vitamin D? They all answer, orange juice. <laughs> That's because we now add vitamin D to orange juice. But we did, for millions of years, we depended on our own bodies to synthesize vitamin D. And it's stored, it's fat soluble. 
it can't it doesn't store indefinitely because we use it up but it is stored so the ultraviolet radiation we've got a and b uh, penetrates the skin initiates the synthesis of vitamin d so that's really important and necessary but ultraviolet radiation does something else also and that is it damages dna oh we don't want that hmm it can suppress the immune system, not good. It can actually, too much can actually degrade circulating vitamin D. Oh, wait a minute. It can make it and it can degrade it, yep. It also degrades another category of nutrients called folates that are important for formation of the nervous system. Okay, so maybe it would be good to regulate the amount of UV radiation that penetrates into our skin. Well, okay, different populations are going to have different regulatory problems, right? Some are going to have a lot of ultraviolet radiation and really want to be careful about DNA damage. Others with less ultraviolet radiation are going to say, oh wait, we have to make sure we get enough vitamin D. So there, there are going to be differences, geographic differences in um, how individuals uh, will uh, regulate the amount of vitamin, uh, of ultraviolet radiation penetrating their skin. And we do so by pigmentation. The more pigment, these are cross sections of skin of uh, individuals with different amounts of melanin, the black pigment that we make in, in our skin cells. Here's someone with very little melanin. That means that ultraviolet radiation, a lot, a high proportion of it is going to pass through the skin into the tissues to make vitamin D. Here's an individual with a little bit of melanin. So they're going to, this person is going to screen out more vitamin D. And here's someone with a lot of melanin who's going, did I, I just said screen out vitamin D. I did not mean that. I meant screen out ultraviolet radiation. And here's someone with uh, a lot of uh, melanin who is, is going to uh, the melanin is going to absorb a lot of that UV radiation, and so less will penetrate. Well, now what? How are we going to link this to skin color? Here we've got another model of global map of ultraviolet radiation. In the middle here, there is ample ultraviolet radiation throughout the year. By ample, I mean there is enough ultraviolet radiation to synthesize vitamin D throughout the year. There is also, if you remember, a very high level of ultraviolet radiation, and there's a high level of high melanin index. So what we have then is in the tropics, where there is high levels of ultraviolet radiation, the driving factor influencing skin pigmentation is making enough vitamin D while not allowing so much vitamin D to penetrate that it causes DNA damage, causes degradation of nutrients. So we have natural selection then for dark pigmentation. In our next band here, this includes, as you'll see, it includes Cleveland. These are areas of the world where there is at least one month a year, and in the case of Cleveland, we have about five months a year, when there is no effective ultraviolet radiation reaching the, the Earth's surface here. By effective, I mean it doesn't initiate the synthesis of vitamin D. So if we live in this climate, 
oh, you know, we don't want to screen out very much vita, uh, ultraviolet radiation when it's available. We want to let it through because it's becoming kind of a sort of scarce resource. So here there's a selection for lighter skin color. The lighter skin color lets more of the scar relatively scarce ultraviolet radiation penetrate into the skin, initiate the synth synthesis of vitamin D. Up here, where we've got the cross-hatching, on average, throughout the year, there is not enough ultraviolet radiation to synthesize vitamin D. Very rarely do they have enough ultraviolet radiation to synthesize vitamin D. So here, there is even a more intense selection to have very little pigment so as to enable the very scarce vita, uh, ultraviolet radiation to penetrate the skin and initiate the synthesis of vitamin uh, uh, D. So you can see that we have different stresses at different parts of the globe. It winds up having a gradient, but in the high latitudes, the low ultraviolet radiation selects for light skin pigmentation to reduce the risk of vitamin D deficiency and to maintain normal function of the skeleton, the nervous system, the immune system. In the higher latitudes, where there's high UV radiation, that selects for dark pigmentation that reduces DNA damage, it reduces immune system uh, suppression, and the destruction of vitamin D and folates. And the result is this pattern of global variation, smooth variation, north-south, north-south, in average skin color. Interestingly, if you, you see that there is light pigmentation in Europe, light pigmentation in Asia, the genes that are responsible are different. The mutations for light skin color that occurred in Asia and in Europe were different. Yet, the biological characteristic of pale skin evolved separately twice. This tells you how strong, how the selection pressure was from ultraviolet radiation to have pale skin. Or as Nina Jablonski says, the strength of selection for depigmentation. Now, where did some of these variants come from? Where did the variants for light and dark skin come from? Well, interestingly, a lot of them originated in Africa. And you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, the variants for light skin color came from Africa? Yeah, some of them. There's one particular gene that accounts for light pigmentation in Europeans that is found with high frequency in Ethiopia and in South Africa. Now, there's not a high frequency of people with light pigment in Ethiopia. However, and that's because of all of the other genes that have the uh, variants for dark pigmentation. But that one particular variant for light skin pigmentation apparently came from the Middle East back into Africa. And then around a couple hundred thousand years ago, when the Homo sapiens left and moved out through the rest of the world, that allele traveled uh, north with migrants in, into uh, the rest of the world. So that's the one of the genes for light skin color actually originated in uh, the Middle East and then Africa and then moved out. Genes for dark skin color, some of them originated in Africa 
and um, left with migrants through the old world and led to dark skin color in southern India and in Melanesia. There are some unique mutations for dark skin color in Africa. So again, we have different sources of variation. We've got environment, evolution, and adaptation. We've got mutation. We've got migration as sources of variation. So globe, the global variation in skin color illustrates gradual variation in a biological trait because there is gradual variation in the environmental stress that's selected for it. So now let's look at a very different type of uh, variation. And this is uh, more recent. This is about 10, 12,000 years ago. We started uh, domesticating plants and animals. And this occurred in a lot of different places throughout the world, as this map indicates. Uh, you can see that the earliest domestication of, of plants, uh, wheat and barley, around 10,000 years ago. Uh, you can see some squash in the New World about 10,000 years ago, millet in the Far East about 8,000 years ago, potatoes, quinoa, rice, all kinds of things um, after that. There was fairly rapid uh, domestication of plants and animals throughout the world. Now, agriculture spread fast. It has advantages. You can produce lots of food, like these potatoes. You can store food, like this uh, reconstruction of an early storage house. You can support more people. However, actually, when we look at the archaeologic record and we look at the skeletons of people who lived before agriculture and after agriculture, we see that there was actually a decrease in height. Okay, individual life histories changed. People's health was poorer, at least for a while. And in some places, people were anywhere from two to five inches shorter after the introduction of agriculture. We think that, in fact, although there may have been more food, there were more uh, periods of poor food, there were more people settling down and living close to one another, getting diseases more often. We can see that the prevalence of cavities increased, prevalence of bony indications of malnutrition increased. This suggests then that our diets might have been a source of selection. You've probably all seen this. This is the US government recommendation for how to eat. Uh, you should have some dairy every day. You should have with, I guess, less than a quarter of your calories, protein. Uh, you should have grains and fruits and vegetables and so forth. Well, before we had domesticated plants and domesticated animals that we could milk, our diet looked kind of like this. We had uh, very little grains. We had some fruits. We had lots of vegetables, and we had a lot of protein. No milk, very few grains. You've probably heard of the Paleolithic diet. Some of you may be adhering to the Paleolithic diet. It's very different than uh, what we think of now. Well, so then after domestication of plants and animals, our diets changed. And the change that I'm going to focus on is the fact that we domesticated animals that we could milk. And some populations, but not all, adapted to this dietary change with, uh, by evolution and adaptation. And the dietary change is that once we had, for example, sheep, goats, camels, cows, yak, we could milk them. We had supplies of milk. And people started drinking milk 
after they were weaned. Until then, we just plain did not do that because there was no milk available. Uh, however, milk has a very special sugar in it called lactose. And only some people can digest that lactose and take advantage of the nutrition, of the, at least that aspect of the nutrition in milk. And you have, may have heard of a trait called lactase persistence. Lactase persistence is also called lactose tolerant. Yes. That is controlled by a single gene. So people can have the variants that we're talking about are going to be someone who is lactose intolerant, could drink a glass of milk with this lactose in it, they don't make the enzyme. The lactose goes through their GI tract, gets to their uh, large bowels, where there are plenty of microbes that say, oh boy. And they digest those, uh, the lactose, and they create gas, and they cause people to have very unpleasant symptoms if they are lactose intolerant and they drink milk. The other variant is called lactase persistence. These individuals, people with this gene, one or two copies of it, can drink milk. They continue to make this enzyme lactase throughout their lives. All of us make this enzyme lactase when we're babies. Typically, mammals and most people stop making this enzyme once they're weaned. But a small proportion of people continue to make this enzyme. That means that they can digest lactose. They can get all of the calories in lactose, all of the calories in milk. The lactose is broken down and they don't get sick. They're called lactase persistence. Look at the global distribution of lactase persistence. The dark color indicates places in the world where more than 90% of the people, of the adults, are still able to make lactase and digest milk and get all the calories from it. The lighter the color, the fewer the people in the population who can digest lactase, lactose. And where do we see the high hot spots? Well, we see hot spots here in Northern Europe. Here's another hot spot in Southern Asia, in the Middle East, in West Africa, little tiny hot spot down here in East Africa. A very different global distribution of genetic variation for this different trait that was selected for by a different factor. So why do some populations have such a high prevalence? And I would note, notice that the caption here says, only a third of the people alive produce lactase. In fact, the, if you wanted to say what is the most frequent condition, it's not producing lactase after you're weaned. As it happens, many people in the US, at least historically, were descended from Northern Europeans. And so in America, we have the idea that milk is great and good for you. It is for some people who have the right genetic variation. So why do some of those populations, like the, that little group of East Africans or Northern Europeans, why do they have a high prevalence of lactase persistence? What is so special about lactose? After all, as I described, it can be digested into other sugars and absorbed. So, you know, so it's there. You can, of course, get the nutritional benefit from dairy foods by letting bacteria break the lactose down. In cheese, the bacteria have broken the lactose down. 
So you can be lactose intolerant and eat cheese. Same for yogurt, but not milk. So this suggests then that for some reason, for some populations, there was selection to drink liquid milk, the lactose-rich form. Well, why? Possibly it, lactose provides calories. Yeah, well, so does cheese. Milk has a protein called lactoferrin that's an antibacterial. Well, that doesn't go away with cheese or yogurt. Milk provides a clean source of water. Hmm. Prior to clean water sources, sanitation, in fact, drinking milk may have been a benefit simply because it was less likely to be contaminated. Another possibility is that milk may enhance the absorption of other nutrients in milk. For example, milk contains high levels of calcium. There's some disputed evidence that liquid milk enables the absorption of the calcium in milk better, and therefore you'll have better bones, which are aided by the vitamin D that you synthesize in your skin. You saw different hot spots for lactose tolerance. Well, in fact, there are different variants. We know in, among Europeans, all of the Europeans who are lactose tolerant <coughs> have a particular mutation in, in the gene. That particular mutation is not found in Africans, in East Africans. Among African pastoralists in East Africa, there's a completely different mutation. So remember we saw in, Europe, in Northern Asians and Northern Europeans different mutations to produce the same phenotype. Here we have among Northern Europeans and East Africans different mutations to produce the same trait. So to summarize, I've given you some examples of human biological variation there's a lot of it. It's distributed around the world in patterns that reflect migration from one place to the next and that reflect evolution and adaptation. Notice that human variation that I described does not fall into categories. In both of those cases, we saw gradual variation. <laughs> we can observe it. We can explain why it exists. And it's there. In some cases, it's adaptive. In many cases, it's adaptive. Variation is just that. It's variation. It's not categorical, it's not good, it's not bad, it's variation. We can observe it, measure it, and explain it. And I will invite you to clasp your hands. What thumb is on top? Oh, left and right, I hear them both. Human variation. I have no idea why this is true, but it is true in every population. Some are right over left and others are left over right. That is for someone else to figure out. But in the meantime, I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. If uh, being tolerant to lactose provides so many benefits, why, what, why is it limited to certain populations? Is there like a selection against um, that in other environmental mm -hmm. conditions or for different reasons? Yeah, I would love to know the answer to that question. Um, it really has not been thoroughly investigated whether the, uh, the milk is clean hypothesis is good, I mean, is a 
is a good explanation. So, uh, or whether the absorption of other nutrients. There are one or two studies, but uh, there again is something for people to take a good look at. I think that the, the alternatives of using dare, uh, fermented milk, uh, yogurt, cheese, probably do almost as good a job of providing, well, they do for the calories in the antimicrobials. It is the case that it has provided a great advantage, and we're not certain why. Any other questions? OK. Ah, uh, yep. <laughs> So what do you say to those who affirm race is just a human social con construct? Race is a social construct. I, did I mention that word once? Did I need that concept once? pigmentation and according to that even the National Institutes of Health makes the difference because there are structure and function and genetic and other kind of differences so they are real they are not made up they are measurable and real I would debate whether they're measurable um, the National Institutes of Health does have a, a uh, requirement that people include in their studies, quote, minorities. And they've got a list of minorities, census categories, right? Just as you say. And yet, if you take a look at studies funded by the National Institutes of Health that include minorities, and you try to figure out how they defined minorities, you will find, in some cases, they say African-American. They don't say born in Africa, moved to, Af to the US, born in the US, lived in the US for how long? They don't say four grandparents, eight grand grandparents self-identify as African-American. They say nothing. They don't describe how they choose that category. Same with Asian. So those categories are really noisy categories. And they are biological. They are social. They are socioeconomic. They are a lot of things. And I think that one of the reasons that many of the studies cannot be replicated is that if you have a hodgepodge of people in your category, which is a category that is socially constructed, but is really heterogene heterogeneous, then you're going to have studies that are hard to replicate. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the uh, right, <laughs> right question so you can address. So I'm interested in uh, learning from you if you can tell us where did the first person or human being or first group of human beings come from? Uh, how did that, how would that impact uh, what this variation you talk about today? I hate to answer that question because we have in the audience the person who knows, who found the evidence for that. Uh, Johannes, if I say East Africa, I'll be safe. Uh, yes, pretty much. Yes. <laughs> yes, East Africa. So we think that the early, probably, our last common ancestor with chimpanzees probably had fur and probably had pale skin. Then as we lost our fur, there was probably selection for dark skin. There would not have been selection yet for lactose tolerance because people were not drinking milk after birth, to give you an example, a couple of examples. So all of us are descended from African ancestors. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you very much.